Michael and, and, uh, and so Morris inviting uh, me to, and, and Jules to come here. Yes, sir. Oh, I get that done. So, uh, again, uh, Clay Norbaum. Anybody here familiar with, has anybody uh, worked with Jewel or Dan Jewel in the past? Anybody? Two people? Three? Yeah. Dan is, uh, again, Dan founded the company almost 30, 35 years ago. Um, so I, at the risk of sounding a little bit like uh, the, the Democratic presidential debate the other day, where everybody's got to raise their hands for, uh, for this or that, do a couple of show of hands questions. So uh, who, who in the room uh, either has land or lives near either wind turbines or solar? Anybody in the room? Quite a few. Um, on the flip side of that coin, uh, who in the room, either through your own project, your own, uh, you know, that you own yourself, or indirectly through an investment, have kind of a stake in either solar or wind from an investment perspective? Okay. So, quite, quite a bit of uh, familiarity with both sides of the coin then, in terms of uh, going through. So, th this is quick. A little bit of background on Jewel then. Uh, you know, Dan Jewel um, was really one of the first in the wind industry in Minnesota uh, in terms of, you know, back again almost 35 years ago. He, he's originally from Red Lake Falls, Minnesota, went out to California where the first wind farm was being built, moved back to Minnesota, and really built the first wind farm in Minnesota down on Buffalo Ridge. And so, you know, we've had a chance over, over the course of the company. To, to kind of follow the industry as it's evolved. And, and you know, with our uh, fair amount of uh, successes and screw ups along the line. Uh, but, you know, we, we've ended up, we've built over uh, 25 projects, and, and almost all of these projects are relatively small. So we uh, occupy kind of an interesting space of, uh, we're neither a very large scale wind developer, but we also don't really do small scale either. So over those years, we've always used what's kind of the current large scale equipment, but we've just deployed it in a much smaller uh, kind of size. So when the big companies are building 100, we build 10. Now, you know, when the big ones are, are building 50 or 100, we're building two or three or four. So we, we've always kind of occupied this space, and what it's allowed us to do is work very closely with communities, very closely with farmers, uh, and, and to try to, you know, really fulfill Dan's vision of saying, you know, let, let's let's have this next inning of the energy race be be something that's more you know community oriented. Yeah. So that's that's a little bit about us along the line. As we learn things along the line over this time period, uh, what leads us to today is one on the technology side. You know, how do we continue to deal with the intermittency of renewables? Right. It doesn't matter at what scale we're involved. As we know, as, as you can put here, you know, the wind turbine doesn't always turn, the solar panel, obviously the sun isn't always out. Right? So, so how do we, how does the grid, how does the system deal with that? And how do we either capitalize on it or, or, or to our peril, how do, we, how do we not figure out that gap? So that's one of the processes that we've been learning over the years. How do we come up with better solutions around that? And second, I would say from kind of the investment angle or from this goal of ours to work closely with the community, closely with agriculture, you know, how do we kind of democratize or how do we best find the model for ownership for investment? Kind of like what Andy was describing with, with the projects that they work on. You know, when you're doing smaller projects, it's very difficult to go raise the right amount of debt equity and so as much as a business professor might want to talk about you know what's this ideal capital structure the reality is if you're on a small scale you're kind of stuck with what you're stuck with and, and you know over the years we kind of have to be in a place where if we can't equity fund or at least build a project to start with that way uh, and we have to go and, and find five different parties to cooperate for every million dollars you know it's, it's pretty difficult to do it so over the years, we've certainly learned a lot of lessons that way. So regardless of what the, the exact title of my talk is, those are the two things that I'll talk about for the next 10 minutes. So here, you know, this is a little bit of a, of a graph of both where 
jewel that's settled into the industry over this last 20 years. And, and for what it's worth, kind of our view of, of, of the grid and where we're going. So, you know, we look at this, and, and, and this is kind of a, uh, you know, snakes around here like this, is a representation of the grid. But, you know, our focus is really what we would call mid-grid. And, and, and acknowledging that, you know, the, the system right now of large central uh, uh, power generation and the, you know, the multiple steps of transmission down and through to the end user, um, you know, we look at it and, and clearly the, the next inning of renewables will continue to have a lot of renewables up at D-scale. Uh, a lot of people argue, of course, that, that what renewables provide and allow for is the, the kind of complete democratization of the energy system. And I guess we would say, you know, we think the reality ends up being somewhere in between, right? That just the, the laws of physics and, and, and the economic reality and everything else is going to mean that we can't have a solar panel on everybody's home in New York City, the density of the cities. <coughs> You can't have everything locally produced, but you know we think that you know, over time there is much more room for for, for this kind of mid grid. And what we mean by this, and what it ends up being in reality, is kind of three main customers to us. One is uh, uh, municipal and co-op utilities. So so the sponsors of the project that are sort of the sponsors here today, the distribution co-ops. Uh, a case study that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, that 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 to us is a market where it, you know there there is this 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 ability to go kind of serve that customer directly that we really haven't had at an economic level before you know or at least not not before the last five years. Uh, in addition to that, you know really the markets of industrial campuses you know those two other markets. Uh, those industrial customers behind the meter or campuses behind the meter, that, that's, that's what we end up being here. So it's either on essentially the customer side of the local substation or on that utility, the smaller utility side uh, of that substation. And, and what's interesting about that is we think that ends up being uh, uh, kind of the right scale to pilot and to be like what Michael talked about before, the right place to really test and build on this intermittency issue. So as we move into more storage, as we move into more how do we match load either through load management lining up with, with, with uh, renewable production, how do we take the overproduction and beneficially use it either for uh, ammonia uh, like they're doing here or for different applications of data center or another there's a number of different applications that are not just storage, but that are a user who can vary their load in order to, to kind of match with, with what the system is. So, you know, that, that goes to, some people think it's, it's silly, probably the, the, uh, the jury's out yet, but even you probably hear about Bitcoin, for example, and these cryptocurrencies. Well, the, the remarkable thing is that all of that on the back end there's a tremendous amount of energy usage for the computers that are in back of all this. So, so one of the areas of load growth across the country are actually these these quote unquote miners of, of these bitcoins. You know, so they're out there scouring the country trying to find sources of electricity that are cheap. Yeah, it's starting up old power plants, buying power from old hydroelectric dams. So, you know, there's any number of different sources of kind of balancing that that are you know fundamentally at this scale that you know over time they, they probably go up and, and, and scale up to something larger in order to really fit the needs but you know right now the next 10 years it's it, it's going to have to be at this scale in order for the you know the technologies to advance this is just a little bit about again essentially now over the last 10 years jewel has worked increasingly across technologies not just wind where we come from, and, and, and again, with a number of different clients across the, the board. The important things coming out of this is, in order to meet what I talked about on, on the former slide of how do we figure out this intermittency, more and more we look at how do we hybrid technologies together. So wind with solar, like what we'll talk about in a minute, wind with storage, wind with an engine, solar with storage, you know, the, again, these kind of mixes. 
small hydro uh, paired with solar. Uh, you know, we we don't like to do anything simple. I guess we're, we're uh, <laughs> we try to do something complicated all the time. You know, this list of clients that we've dealt with over time, including the University of Minnesota, uh, probably more important, I, I noticed on here, what's really missing is the agricultural community. And it goes without saying, uh, uh, you know, over time, of course, we've always dealt very closely with agriculture in terms of citing anything that we've done. Uh, over the last 10 years, that's included increasingly working with farmers as owners and investors in our projects alongside of us. And I think increasingly now, one of the missing elements of here is that we see kind of the third leg of that stool of really agriculture in one shape or another being the customers as well. Over the projects that we've built over the years, uh, because of you know different uh, you know, legislation in Minnesota and in, 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 in the kind of the pro-renewable tilt of Excel and, and others of the large utilities, you know, we built a lot of those projects and sold that power into the utility, into the large utility. You know, now if I look at, at the projects we're working on, like I said, one way or the other, whether that is to a rural distribution co-op, who's you know ultimately just serving agriculture in many cases, or whether that be to um, you know a more direct uh, industrial customer. So one of the places that we see a major amount of growth right now that dovetails very closely with what Andy was talking about is the biofuel space. You know, everything that Andy talked about in terms of CI scores, carbon intensity scores, and all this, all of the ethanol and the biodiesel companies, they're all looking at that same metric. How do they reduce their carbon intensity in order to sell their product into California at a higher value? And so one of the elements of that is can they source directly connected renewable energy. Uh, and so, again, just another very close connection point to, to agriculture. And, and really getting back to, to what all of the speakers have been talking about, you know, they need to, those biofuel producers ultimately need to track their carbon intensity, not just on the electricity usage, not just on the natural gas usage or, or, or you know, how they use heat, but down to the you know underlying soil practices, the, the you know the, the crop practices. So the the, the best um, you know the best movers in that space are again trying to harness all of those together. And if they can, you know the value that they can drive from that in California is, is great. So just move on while we have a little bit of time here. So the case study that we brought here uh, is as I mentioned working with rural co-op utilities. You know, in this theme of hybrid and dealing with intermittency, um, Jewel has been working over the last couple of years with GE uh, on a hybrid of wind and solar together. So this picture here is, is near Pelican Rapids, essentially between Pelican Rapids and Fergus Falls, a project that just went online at the end of December, beginning of January of this year. Uh, and essentially it's, it's based on a building block concept, the solar, interconnects through uh, the converter on a wind turbine. We save some capital through that. Uh, and it ends up to the grid, it ends up being a centrally controlled system where essentially to the grid, it looks like a wind turbine that's backed up by solar. And if you think of it, you know, on days like today or throughout the winter, you know, there's a natural tendency in our weather patterns where high pressure, low pressure, uh, it, you know, if, if we can, um, Throughout summer production, when wind production tends to go down, again, we're, we're backing that up with solar and we're, we're providing something that's of higher value to the utility when they're needing their power most and the wind might be down in that part of Minnesota, we're at least backing that up with solar. Just a little bit more on it because again, that, that actually is the first true hybrid, at least what we at GE claim. It, uh, the first true hybrid system like that deployed in the US. Um, again, that went online there. So Lake Region uh, Electric Co-op, who's the buyer of the power, uh, is quite proud of it. They just sent out a, a mailer that I saw in terms of to their members and claiming it. But uh, this is a little bit more about, about the project. It, it, you know, we ended up bringing together a large partnership. One of the interesting elements of it is that, uh, which also, can benefit other co-ops potentially is, is that
that you know we're also harnessing the idea that uh, this scale project, uh, you know, you think of all the large companies that are talking about going green sustainability. Uh, there's a lot of interest out there by those companies in essentially quote unquote sponsoring projects. You know, they 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 want to be able to claim that they're green, and you know the rules that they have to follow in order to claim that they're green. So, you know, without getting into all of those, they can buy what are essentially called renewable energy credits. And so, you know, a project like this where we're using new technology, we're supporting the local community, we're supporting the local rural co-op. You know, that's like mom and apple pie to a uh, you know to a large corporate marketing team. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of inbound interest of saying, well, look, you know, we will pay a premium for the ability to buy the RECs off of a project like this and be able to, to show this in our sustainability report to be able to, you know, really be a part of this. So, you know, our, our pitch back to the wider community of, of, of co-ops and like, you know, Lake Region and others was to say, look, you know, this will limit a little bit of how much you can talk about your, you know, that, that you're buying renewable power, but as long as you're willing to say that you're doing this because you want to buy locally derived power, and as long as you're willing to kind of share the stage with, in this case, Bank of America, who wants to do this marketing, as long as you're willing to share the stage with them, you know, they're gonna come in and subsidize your project for you. And so, you know, when you go out and talk to your members, talk to the, the farmers in the community. You know who, who, who's going to be uh, who's going to be laughing about that. You know, if, if Bank of America wants to come in and make your electricity cheaper, you know that's that's probably not a bad not a bad deal. So again, we you know we see more and more uh, throughout the system, throughout Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin. You know, more of uh, the distribution co-ops have the ability to do. Maybe it's five or ten percent of their own generation uh, outside of their contracts with with their providers, and you know that ended up that was an amount that was not really efficiently served up until in the last few years. Again, where technology has gone through the turbines that we're using here and the others, you know, we're really now at a scale where you can supply that one turbine with two or two and a half megawatts. At a, at a price that, you know, especially throughout Western Minnesota, at a price that essentially is competitive or, or, or lower. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's where we're at now. It was no good to have that carve out, again, five years ago, if that meant that by using the carve out, you were gonna voluntarily pay more money. You know, we're kind of now in this inning where it's, it's interesting that way. And just one final comment as it kind of relates to this question of financing. I asked the question about who's been invested in one way or the other. You know, Jewel over time, including in the community here, you know, not too far north of here in Grand County, a lot of the projects that we built with the local community, with the local farmers, uh, you know, were built up of a project limited liability company that had local owners and had, like I said, about financing. You know, we ended up with a very, very complicated structure for what were relatively small uh, projects. And that was a very admirable goal. Uh, but if we really want to continue to take this forward, we have to learn and adapt to be able to say, okay, what, you know, where can we keep something that has both, you know, community flavor that allows somebody who wants to invest in something down to a, you know, a level that is not just a millionaire's club, but where can we kind of balance this this. And, you know, whether right or wrong, where Jewel has kind of ended up is, is that, you know, we formed our own company that is a part of the company that I run, where we own any project that we can develop and we can try to own ourselves, we want to. And through that, we essentially raise outside investment, refer stock, you know, down to relatively small levels, but it ends up being that all of our projects underneath us, including the Lake Region project I was talking about, you know, are essentially owned in one vehicle. And what that means is that, you know, if, if, if a local farmer who wants to be part of our next project wants to host the site for the next co-op that wants to do it, and, and we always want, again, to encourage local ownership, 
if they want to say, you know, I've got 25 grand to put in, you know, I, I want to be part of the ownership here, but you know, I don't want that money to be, I don't want a lot of hassle about it, I want to understand it, I don't want a lot of risk with it. You know, like anything else, when you have some diversification and some pooling of it, we've kind of found that that's you know, what, what kind of makes sense for everybody. So th that's, that's where we've evolved to. And again, for what it's worth, it, it kind of fits something in between because in the wind industry now, you know, there's essentially six large wind developers. Um, they're all owned either by a foreign subsidiary or a large utility uh, company that owns them. So if you want to invest in that, you know, you go invest in the stock of, of that company. If you want to invest in wind farms, invest in Florida Power uh, stock. Okay, that's one way to do it. Uh, otherwise, you might be able to participate through a lease. But there's, you know, in increasingly less option for kind of, you know, how, how do you participate other than putting up your own, you know, small wind turbine. So, you know, when I thought about the question of financing, um, you know, larger renewables, again, <laughs> at the large scale, that's going to happen. There's a lot of very large investors throwing a lot of money at large scale wind and solar. So there's really no need to say, well, where does the little guy or where does the you know, little person fit into it? Uh, so again, things like this, structures like this is kind of where the, the, the industry has evolved to say anything else other than very localized solar panels or, or your own wind turbine, you know, ends up being kind of these, you know, one-off vehicles like ours or others that to try to find the, the, the place in between. And alongside of that, you know, we just kind of ended up looking at it and saying, okay, then what can we do to help build a little bit more protection and diversification around that? And you know, for lack of anything else, we, we actually ended up uh, buying a number of smaller hydros uh, in order to, again, just continue to kind of buttress the cash flow from our first wind project. So again, if you think of like Andy's point about saying, okay, you have to go store natural gas and wait for cash flow for a certain amount of time. Well, if we raise a lot of capital and we have to continue to pay dividends out on that, and you know, we go through all we have is Minnesota wind. We've, we've suffered through it enough years to know that you know through those summer months when wind production is down, you know, cash flow gets a little uh, a little tight as we start to pay it out. So, you know, we we have to find our own ways to kind of you know fit with that and. That's a long story about, uh, you know, Jewel, kind of our evolution, where we're at, and what it's seen. Any questions? I was at a meeting on Monday, and one of the members said that uh, this is MRES, Renewable Energy, uh, it said that in southern Minnesota, there's this one swamp of turbines that was not turning apparently because of a lack of maintenance. And I'm guessing, were those farmer owned? Or is that, I guess the farmers were kind of ticked off about the whole thing because it, it must have been maybe some kind of uh, cooperation situation. Well, if I guess what the project might be that you're talking about, like these mid wind Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, it is kind of an example of kind of in back of what we talked about um, in terms of this pooling up that we ended up doing. You know, there were a number of projects, those projects, not one that, that we were involved in terms of that, but but where you had local ownership, and again, where it's kind of the, as much as you want to democratize investment, there's kind of that, what's the right Goldilocks place to be? And so, you know, if I, if I have the right project and there, no. you know, what, what ended up is that you know, these things are, are complicated, right? And the maintenance, the overseeing, it's not something for kind of a hobby, right? It's something where you need professional management around it. So some of those projects down in the, the southwest part of the state where it kind of was completely farmer owned, operated, you know, there were some things missed that ended up coming back to, to bite them. So, you know, some of those projects went through bankruptcy and went through some issues where you know, I think the individual owners of those ended up losing some money. So if it's a contract, who was, who was supposed to do that? I mean, that's on you? <coughs> well, it wasn't ours. No, I mean, on the yeah. farmer. Yeah, yeah, no, so I mean, so, so I think, again, as much as, it, as much as it seemed like a good idea, again, like I said, it kind of shows the limits of, 
if you democratize something too much and it's something where you know it is a very specialized industry, you kind of buyer beware. You know, you you so you know I, I think again that the industry has gone through that. It's the same thing with with you know Minnesota's had this uh, community-based energy development, CBED. Joel participated in it, and, and again it, it allowed for a lot of there was space for smaller wind development amongst the bigger development. But it had a lot of, it had a requirement of a certain amount of local energy, again, in the project level. And, and it, again, it just led to, um, like I said, not only kind of complexity, but it, it's hard for somebody, if 20 years ago, they were said, okay, you're gonna own 1% of this project, and you might not see any cash flow from it for 10 years, but then after that, you might see something. You know, it's really hard to keep track of all that. It is, it's ended up being, you know, kind of a, an accounting nightmare and everything else where it's much, much better to have it at kind of a, a little bit higher level. Okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, why, why have, hasn't wind on a community ownership level had the same success, relative success of ethanol? I mean, you know, they, they're both complex, relatively close to the same dollars amount involved. Is, is it because we have more competition on the wind side and more challenging access to regulatory environment, possibly? Yeah, you know, I, it's a good question. It really is a good question. I've never <laughs> quite heard the question asked exactly that way. Because you're right, there is a lot of parallel. And, and, and in fact, some of the groups that tried to make that transition uh, <laughs> are, are some of the ones that tried to do it. You know, I, again, I think it is, uh, you know, ethanol is a specialized industry also, but you know, I, I think it just ended up that this is a, a very specialized industry. If you only own, well, the only thing you own is a couple of wind turbines, and, and again, you're competing with, you know, for labor and for the technicians and everything else who are serving 200 wind turbines. It's, I think that's where it just kind of broke down a little bit. Ron. So I, I don't think there's an inherent reason why those, why it would have to be that way. But as, as a tax attorney who practiced in the area, two thirds of the value of a wind development is in the tax benefits. In order to successfully move those tax benefits to someone who can actually use them, you've got to have a $50 million plus project. And that, that gets to be too big for uh, local ownership. Oh, yeah. The first time I worked with Jewel professionally, they were packaging a 20 megawatt project for J.P. Morgan and they succeeded in selling it to them for local owners here in Minnesota. No, I think, I think that, you're right, John, that's probably one of the other big reasons. And, and it's one of the big things happening right now in the global grid is, is, is the tax credits are ramping down. Uh, you know, it potentially changes it, you know, because, uh, you know, John is right. The, the, the dependency <coughs> on, on, you know, right now from an economic perspective, projects need them much less. But, you know, you can't voluntarily, in so much as there's a tax credit available, <coughs> We can't tie one arm behind our back and say, "Well, we're not going to use tax credits, right?" You can't compete with everybody else. Well, well, nobody will buy the power from you for that price. Uh, no, yeah, no, nobody will buy it from somebody who's getting the tax benefit. Exactly. So, what that means, though, is that there's a very small universe of those tax credit buyers. <coughs> Other? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. 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 Are you able to say anything about the PUC conflict with other tail power that went on for? I don't, you know. I, I, no I, is an acceptable answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's probably probably not. I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, over over time, one of the things that that uh, I guess I would answer is, you know, the whole idea of avoided cost. You know, what what is the utilities avoided cost? You know, again, the the, the federal regulations, PERPA, you know, the the legislation that goes back to the seventies. That, that we all kind of operate under the idea that you know we can go build a project and you know and sell to the utility that the utility theoretically has to buy that power, not theoretically it just has to, but but where the rubber meets the road is you know at what price as you're talking about. You know again I think that, that there's plenty of more uh, cases of where that will play out over time. I, I guess I would just say again it goes back to the internet. 
at a certain at a certain point, as we continue to better match load, have have more ability to match load, the one point in the system where I would argue there's not a true market discovery of value is capacity. You know, what's the value of capacity in the system? And right now, if you have a truly intermittent resource that the grid can't depend on, it's easy to argue to say that there's next to zero capacity value. Right? So, you know, the more that there's an ability to actually kind of prove and back up the capacity point, and the more that is able to be closer to the customer, either through the rural co-ops or others who are themselves paying <coughs> demand charges and other forms of capacity. Again, I think that's where it will end. You know, that's where things will settle out over time. You know, versus getting into whatever the specifics of that is. But that's that's where I think the world goes for over the years. Yeah. Last question. The, the, the first slide talks about what's kind of our uh, our building block vision there that we built at Lake Region. To be clear, Lake Region does not have storage on it yet. And so the building block of the wind plus solar is meant to be wind plus solar plus hybrid. But sorry, wind plus solar plus battery. But we don't have a battery on that project yet. So I you know so it's to be clear that's not we don't have a battery. And the next question would be, what do you see as battery technology for that um, that, that can handle different extremes in temperature? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we spend a lot of time looking at, you know, what are different, you know, mediums that, as you probably know, you know, the, the battery evolution has been a perennial disappointment to all of us, right? So it, 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 uh, I always say, you know, battery technology is five years off, and then of course, it's always five years out. You know, five years out, it'll be five years out. You know, we, for what it's worth, we, we have to continue to look at what is investable and what is most bankable. So, you know, in so much as GE can supply us their packaged unit, that's what we will go to, right? Even if that uses cells that are, you know, built by the same, uh, you know, LG or, or anybody else underneath, you know, we're going to have to go to a packager like GE. And, and even if that costs a little bit more, you know, we need somebody like them to be able to stand behind it and say, yes, it can operate at these specs and we're going to make it good, even if it doesn't. So, you know, that's, as we go to install, that's where we're going to be for the next years. We, we can't take risks on, we certainly follow what are other things out there, but, you know, for now, we can't take risks on that down. I, I just want to comment that uh, if you have battery questions, talk to Coe. Herman or Bill Thompson in the back. Uh, they've done quite a bit of research on batteries and hope to install a full battery down into the MF campus soon uh, in partnership with RHL Power. And I appreciate uh, the way you delicately handled that question about RHL Power because Warren Mox Moxis from RHL is, is here with us today. <laughs> and uh, we certainly appreciate them. And that's, that's what I was talking earlier about uh, is that you know, over the 10 years ago, there was a lot of conflict between renewable energy advocates and utilities. And 20 years ago, when I first started, it was even worse. Uh, I'm starting to see uh, all these groups come together, together much more, work together. And obviously, there's still some there's still some challenges as we see another. Everyone's trying to project their own piece of pie, which we expect. Uh, but again, thank you very much, Clay. Appreciate it. Thank you.